Does anyone have a whiteboard marker? Oh, a anyone other than Andy? Two. Poor Andy. Zero. Good. Two. Thank you. Oh, good. Ah, oh. <laughs> Curtis, good man. All right. One. Um, five. How did you go? Nine. Four. Uh, eight, let's just have random one, ideas. Just go around five, the room. Just give us one. Nine, four. No, no. Uh, so I live in the village. Yes. The doors don't close. The doors to the. Oh, oh, that's really cool, except for the first bit. <laughs> Just don't say that bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the doors don't shut properly, so you can just open the door. That's so funny. That's the best one. I think that is going to be the best of today. Open the door. Okay, cool. Um, you can't really see that. Can't see it. It's camouflaged. It's obscure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I won't try them then. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, there's a balcony, right? Uh, and you can get in just by breaking through the glass and sliding through. Um, Did you start by saying, I also live in the village? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad man. All right, you can go through a balcony. Open the door. Yeah. <laughs> Mildly better. Balcony. Yep, cool. Um, we'll start at this end. Yeah, oh, what do you got? Impersonate a car. Impersonate a car. Impersonate a car. That's not a bad idea. Normally, normally there's multiple ways of getting into a house, and often through the garage with a remote control. Yeah. Yeah, or yeah. You can like put a steak with a balloon inside, and then you pull the steak into the thing, and then you can pretend to be the car coming out. Ah, that's interesting. Trip a movement sensor by inflating a balloon yes. inside. Very cool. Yeah, you need to know how the yeah, because there'll be fail safes on the door to stop people being squashed by it and things like that. Yes. Brilliant. And also, sometimes you can just do a replay attack on a car garage thing. Sometimes they haven't got what we call a nonce on them, something that stops it being repeated. So a replay attack is when someone's authenticated through a message, perhaps you can hear the message, because normally the medium is not secure, it's just a message that you have control over, and then replay it. And I used to, when my parents-in-law got a, a remote control garage door opener, I was so excited that I could just point at the door and open it. I looked inside and it just had a couple of dip switches. There were so few combinations, it was so lame. So whenever we were driving around their town, I'd just be out the car, just pointing at <laughs> everywhere, just hoping around everywhere there'd be, you know, one in every 16 doors would just <laughs> solid. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good one. Well done. Did you have one too? No, you did. Yeah, you shoot first. So you could blackmail the owner? <laughs> yep, blackmail. Blackmail who? The person who's living there. Like Blackmail them to break into their house. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> or you could pretend to be someone else. Like, it's like yeah, 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 yeah. And blackmail, impersonate. Pizza person. Pizza. Yep. Yeah, mine was on the similar line of that. It was like, um, impersonate a policeman. Ah, impersonate authority. That's very good. Good. More. Yep. Be a friend. Be a friend. Oh. <laughs> um, now look, we're gonna, that's, a, that's actually a really good one because um, we're going to see over and over again that most security vulnerabilities arise from trust and normally what we see is either trust being abused or trust being mistakenly applied to something mistakenly trusting something that we shouldn't trust. Um, now, abuse of trust is, um, look, I think trust is a lovely thing, and I like a world with trust. Because of that, we can have libraries, and we can have parks, and we can have you know, all these really nice things. This is why we can have nice things. Uh, and I personally think people that abuse trust, uh, I think the technical word is dicks. <laughs> so in this course, please don't be a dick. So there's awesome hacking that's so impressive that makes your toes curl and you just, oh, we're not worthy when you see someone doing it. And then there's just someone being a dick. So you, you need to defend. So it's really good you brought it up. You need to defend against dicks. But I hope none of you, I mean, well, it's probably time to talk about the course code. The course code is while you're in this course, because we live in constant worry that one day there'll be a newspaper headline saying, UNSW trains the next generation of computer criminals or something like that. 
Not realizing, of course, that computer criminals are very well educated already and all the information we're talking about is easily available on the net. No secret or special thing going on here. There's no shortage of bad guys. Where there's a shortage is there's a shortage of good guys. So, um, but because I live in fear of that newspaper headline, because that would then spoil this course, not just for us, but in the future, the uni might not let us run it anymore. Well, I, I would hope that would, but it's, it puts a course at risk. So I ask you all, and I should ask the people on the camera too, um, I ask you guys to, please don't do anything while you're in this course that could bring the course into disrepute in some way. So, because that will stuff up the course for future people. So just, if you normally hack, please don't hack while you're in the course, or if you hack while you're in the course, don't do it while you're on campus or using the Wi-Fi, and don't <laughs> write 3441 over everything you hack. And if you're contemplating hacking, well then, please do it ethically and responsibly, and we'll talk in the future about how to do it ethically and responsibly and legally. But please don't do anything while you're in this course. Be scrupulous. I'm not going to give you a set of rules of what you can and can't do, because you know, it's a security course. We'll all work out ways around the rules. That, 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 <laughs> that, that satisfy the letter of the rule but um, ruin the objective. So, um, and that, I love you for that. Um, so what I want you to do is just, please just act, don't act in a way that will spoil the course for future people to do. That's, that's the sort of course code. It's very simple. Um, and I do, I do think abuse of trust is always a sad thing when it happens. Um, but we have to be aware that it can happen. It's a number one vulnerability, I think, is uh, um, uh, someone abusing a trust that you place in them or some system abusing trust that's been placed in them. No one will ever type that in this field. <laughs> and someone does. Uh, okay, keep going. That was good. More. This room's hot. Are other people hot or is it just me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, at the back there was a hand. Was it you? The girl? No? No, no? No? Yes? One, two, three. Climb down the chimney. Chimney. <laughs> the Santa trick. <laughs> cool. Roof tiles, that's more like it, uh, is what we're starting to see. We have to think that a house is more than a door. Yes? Um, they can make the house as secure as they want, but if they're not careful with their keys, then... All right, All right good. So the key is a good, a good vulnerability. How would you attack the key? Um, a lot of people, like, in like an electronic sense, it's like a lot of people use the same password for a lot of things. Okay, yeah, all right. Oh, yeah, in electronic... What about in the house? For the house? I, uh, key under the rock. Yeah. Yep, yep, I reckon. Um, if you tie, I reckon if you tie a two or three metre piece of string, I keep oscillating and thinking about it, to the doorknob of a house, the front door, and use that to inscribe a sphere or a hemisphere or something like that, there's a good chance there's a key within that hemisphere somewhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, people will often hide the, the front door key somewhere in, inside a rock, in a pot plant, underneath, somewhere. So, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just so common, but it's amazingly how often people do that. So yeah, attacking the key is good. Another way of attacking a key is um, the way that the die bulb machines were attacked, the election machines. Does everyone know about that? The original machines could be compromised that ran American elections, or some American elections in some states. They could be compromised um, by just reaching a hand around the back and fiddling with a couple of things or sticking in a USB stick. So they locked the box and the machines then came with a lock on it. So during presidential elections, no one could get in because we we're protected by a lock. Only problem is they use the same key for every machine. And even worse, if you went to buy one of the machines, you didn't even have to buy it because there was a photo, look, now with key, and there was a photo of the key. So within one day of it coming out, someone printed the key onto a piece of paper, tacked it onto a thing, filed a blank down, and made a diebold key from the photo. So yeah, keys are, the number of combinations in a key is actually quite small if you do a bit of locksmithing. And we will do a bit of locksmithing later on. So yeah, keys aren't everything they're cracked up to be. Uh, and if, yes, keep going. If I'm a dog door. Dog door. Good man. And I wonder, yeah, if the dog door was too small, no, you'd be surprised. If your head gets in somewhere, your body can. If um, just a caving thing, not a housebreaking thing. But um, uh, I was just trying to think, if the door was too small, what could you do? Well, you could find their dog and put a bit of blood on its back or something or give it scratch marks. Yeah, 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 and reach various devices inside. Um, I was just trying to think you could maybe even socially engineer them to make the door hole bigger if you give their dog a sore back in some way and they start to think that that's... What about dogs? Yes. Well, we had it. So you can capture the dog. Capture the dog. And then record the dog barking in distress by doing something yes. in the to it. And then you will pay the son outside of the house to lure the owner out of the house while you're sleeping. Okay, well... Um, yeah, uh, exploit dog. <laughs> 
If, if you can get someone to go outside, perhaps you can duck in behind them. Yep, these are good. Uh, yep, keep going. Uh, you can be, can be like a, um, a Trojan and you can walk in with two people and one of them's concealed and then, you know... Oh, very nice. And then one walks out. One walks out. Did I... Um, so the, there's, um, this is completely irrelevant, but just a little thing like that. They do the same thing with crows. This is how they worked out that crows could count to five, apparently. They uh, have a, a hide uh, with... They put food in. Have people heard this experiment? And then the, the, they, uh, they put the food in the hide and then they go away. And when they've gone away, the crows nearby... Uh, there's a rookery or whatever you call it of crows nearby. So when they go away, the crows come in. Uh, and then two people would go into the hide and one person would come out and the crows would wait. But then the second person would come out and the crows would go. And they increased that up to five. And the crows could count up to five, but at six they got confused. And five people leaving was enough. So yeah, you could do like a, a Trojan, some sort of really clever Trojan thing. I often think um, there was a law office once that I had to evaluate the sec physical security of. And I was able to, from the foyer, get to the reception area, which was uh, insecure. Um, and go to the toilet and then just wait. And it was a long, boring wait, but eventually everyone went home <laughs> and I was in. So there you go, because the actual barrier to get in wasn't a, it was just step over a thing once there was, the guard wasn't at the gate. So yeah, so, um, so that's a good one. Yep, Trojan it, yep. Uh, um, get legit entry, not leave somehow. Good, yep. Uh, it's like a large apartment complex. Yes. Yes, that's called tailgating. Tailgate someone in. Um, just as a matter of principle, I always try and tailgate into the CSE building here, or A building here. Um, it's very rare that anyone would stop someone tailgating. And at the banks now, to stop people tailgating, they have big signs saying no tailgating. I'm not sure that that's effective, because people might not know what tailgating is. I think, but then they have really vicious looking sliding things that detect tailgating. And yes. Yeah, I've seen, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was at an A bank. Um, who had this sort of um, non-tailgating mechanism there. And it was after hours, and I tailgated someone out, who was accomplice with me. We were just testing it out. And an alarm went off. It detected I tailgated. And we waited there for four or five minutes, but no one came. <laughs> so, um, so there's you know, deterrence, but then there's actual action on deterrence. So tailgating is a really effective way of getting in. I remember one year, um, we were running this course, and a wonderful former student, I think it was Barney Desmond, just wandered up to the keypad and said, oh, that's interesting. And he started just hitting his fingers all over the keypad. And I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm fuzzing it. <laughs> and he just hit it, hit it. And then eventually this boom admin console popped up. <laughs> if you push it a couple of magic spots on it, this special system programming console comes up. I was so impressed. Um, so he was a good student. Um, so yeah, tailgating, what else? Yep. You can call saying that you locked yourself up. Like you can uh, yeah, yeah, call a locksmith. They probably won't authenticate you and they'll let you in? Well, no, like, uh, if you have neighbors, you just call, or you call a lot, like, buzz on all the things and you say, oh, I forgot. Ah, oh, okay, for a flat, for a flat, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buzz in, buzz in, got it. Uh, but actually, that even worked with locks. I have been locked out of our own house, called the locksmith to come and get, break us in, and they never authenticated me. So, there you go. Has anyone ever had a locksmith help them get into a car, which is harder? Did they authenticate you? Uh, they did in when we did. Yeah yeah yeah. yeah, 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 You would think that would be like locksmith 101. Well, we, uh, we were, uh, you look suspicious, sir. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, for payment sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good one. Kick down the door. Very, very rarely is the door well secured. Um, Normally there's just a little tab here that goes into a little spot there and it's sort of weak in front of the tab. Sometimes there's reinforcing there, but if you've ever built a door yourself or put a lock on, it's always the frightening thing when you realise how flimsy it is. Normally just a well-placed dunk on it, well, according to the movies, gets you in. Um, and the other thing about doors... Did you have a... Yeah, yeah, back door, thank you. The other thing about doors is often, for some reason, the hinge bolts are on the outside, so then you just need a little uh, punch and... Pum, 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 pop the bolts out. Um, okay, yeah, but back door. It's surprising how often the front door's secure and the back door's wide open. Well, the front door's an expensive door and the back door's a cheap door. Or else we haven't even hit windows. Yeah, windows and no walls. Window, walls, thanks. I like walls. I'm going to put that next to roof. Because I like the way you think like a cube and there's an obvious extra one. Floor, thank you. 
Floor's easy, and often there'll be power underneath, so just with a small jigsaw you can cut out a floorboard and get through, they're normally quite thin. So you can get through a floor, you can get through a roof, and you can get through, the roof's there, probably the easiest, but you're more visible, under the floor's a bit hidden. Um, I was once burgled by people just actually just smashing with a brick the side of our house. We lived in an old terrace. They just smashed through the old fibro wall and went into the house, bypassed all our bars and everything. Um, so, yeah, okay, we'll just get a couple more. Yes? Police uniform. Police uniform. <laughs> Good. More? Um, so, I knew a guy who was like a water um, meter checker, and he, uh, the police came up to a house once while it's in the house, checking the water meters in the house. Yes. They, just, they saw he was wearing a uniform. And yes. Not. Yes. still got that uniform even though it doesn't work there anymore. Yes, I have a fireys uniform at home. I think it's like a free pass to get anywhere. If you wear a fireys uniform, you, just, you can just walk in and, you know, you can inspect cupboards, you can look at wiring cabinets, you can, you know, just, yeah, I'm wearing a fireys uniform, except now I'm a bit older, it looks less plausible. Yes? Uh, you can social engineer the key. Yeah, how would you do that? Do the five double pipe wrench. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Social engineer the what? The key, you're saying? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, we call that with breaking codes, that's called rubber hose cryptanalysis. <laughs> we, you just, someone uh, use violence to extract the key. Because, you know, people don't necessarily want to keep a key at all costs. Um, yeah, so um, uh, intimidate. How much do you want, like, like the house? Yes. Is it an old box? Yes, all right, if they've got a burger alarm, you're thinking? Yeah, how do we deal with burger alarms? couple of ways. One is trip the fuse box. Um, it will take a while for the battery to go flat, but you can encourage it perhaps by setting the movement sensor off one day and coming back the next day. Uh, another way of uh, defeating burglar alarms, which is really awesome, I've seen is you just trip the alarm one day, then trip it the next day, and then trip it the next day. And when you come back on the third day, the box will be smashed with a crowbar <laughs> and all the neighbours will be standing around outside. <laughs> yes? Fire escape. Fire escape. Okay. So, I hope it's clear to everyone. We haven't even hit um, some of the... Are there any awesome ones that people have really want to say and haven't said yet? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, um, uh, cause people to flee. Yes. <laughs> You're a bad man. Yes. Crack the lock. Crack... Crack the lock. Crack, like pick it with a... Yeah. A rake it or something? You use the card, but you can use the something like a... <laughs> oh, if it's an electronic lock, you can break... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, often, um, depending on how the authentication works for an electronic lock, um, you can possibly tack in, tap in and brute force it if you get to the wires in the panel. Or if, it, if the lock is... I don't think they make locks like this anymore, but in the old days, sometimes the, lock, the keypad itself would work out if you're allowed in or not. So you just have to find the line that goes high when it's OK and make that go high. Um, I was actually outside a really important serious office with the CEO of a big important company and uh, they'd flown down, I'm not important, but there was an important person there, and they'd flown down and they were having a big meeting and then they were, time to go in, back into the office and get their bags and they realised everyone had gone home and they were locked out. And we're in this really high security building, but they were locked out. And they said, oh no, what are we going to do? So she started calling um, uh, you know, other people and trying to get the building manager and various people, but here's what I did. What do you think I did? Yeah, I tried it. This is the security way of thinking. We try things. So I thought, yeah, maybe it's an impervious door and it's going to be uncrackable and now it's locked, we're going to be doomed. Or maybe I can get in. And I looked at it and it was one of these locks, which you can defeat by pushing something in. It had to defeat this mechanism here that stops that working, but that wasn't properly engaged in the frame. So I could open it just with a credit card. So she was really impressed. I just said, chuk, chuk, oh, we're in. Now, I'm not suggesting you should do that, but I, I sort of am. Not to break into things, but just to suddenly realize how vulnerable everything is. You look at things and they look secure and they're not. You look at things with the eyes of a defender. I want you to look with the eyes of an attacker. Not because I want you to attack and not because I want you to break the law. Don't do that. That's being a dick. And it's illegal and you'll go to jail. And with cyber, the penalties are so ridiculous. It's a really weird the way the law works with cyber. I think everyone's so frightened of it. If you do even things that most people would regard as innocuous, I think, you can go to jail for very long periods of time. And everyone's frightened and it's tough. And so it's quite erratic. So please never break the law. Don't do any hacking. Don't do anything illegal ever. 
please, please, just for your own sake, even if you don't think it's being a dick to do it. But you've got to be aware of it. You've got to be aware that if you think like a defender, everything will look so secure. Our front door, I put the best lock on the front door, not noticing the bolts are in the wrong spot, the hinges in the wrong spot, uh, the key can be stolen, the key can be observed, there's a back door that's open, the wall's insecure, the floor's insecure, the roof's insecure, we can be tricked, we can be blackmailed, we can be bribed, our car can go, you know, we behave irrationally when we think there's a fire. Just not noticing the million possible things. And do you know, we could, many of the things on this list have not ever been said in the years that I've asked people this question. And I reckon we could keep going for another hour and keep thinking of new ways. There's an infinite number of ways of breaking into a house. It's so easy to break into a house. Not saying that anyone should break into a house. Don't break into a house. But just be aware that we at home think things are so secure and they're not. And companies in their home, in their digital home, feel the same way. If you're ever in a place that's proud of its security mechanisms and thinks it's impossible to break, you're just living in the 1850s in those black chambers where everyone can see the evidence in front of their eyes that nothing's secure, but they still for somehow believe their stuff's secure. Now, can I tell you the best one that I ever heard? It was from one student who said, um, and something like this. He said, I would go to the local shopping center and I would... Um, put up a booth in the middle and say, call us um, super cheap locksmiths and hand out flyers for a free set of house keys or something like that, uh, you know, for, to every new customer or something. And you can go in a drawer for an iPad or something or cheap keys if they're too suspicious with that. And you just literally get people give you their keys and you make duplicates of them and you keep track of which ones you've done. And somehow there's some authentication mechanism where they write down their address for some reason. Uh, you know, if you sign up to our newsletter, you will cut your house keys for free or something. At the end of the day, you could have keys for 50 houses to get into. But someone else thought of an even better idea. He said, well, why go to the bother of breaking in and stealing their jewels? Why don't you just open a booth in a local shopping center that says, or in a fancy shopping center, that says free jewelry cleaning or half price jewelry cleaning? Bring your jewelry here and we'll clean it. It's really inefficient price. in terms of like, I happens to be a law student. Like, you're going to go to so much jail time versus the amount of money you make. This is a oh, really yeah. bad way you should be I, I like that you're already you're thinking like a lawyer. Jail, yeah, yeah. This is the amount of money you make. This is like really bad. Um, and now it's funny, the person, a, a person did tell me something like that once and they were a lawyer too. And they did say, you should never ever break the law. Oh, that's another thing that's uh, Unless you make a lot of money. That's correct. <laughs> and so that, the and of, they were a lawyer. The no. time of jail you get, <laughs> over the, um, uh, compared to the money, the amount of money involved in a crime is logarithmic. You should do like super big payout. <laughs> and get a of of and <laughs> okay, all right, well, <laughs> look, I, what I really like is, it, is your analytical thing, but I've got to say, I, I just don't think it's right to steal things. I think you're being a dick, but not you, the person who steals things is being a dick because the jewellery you steal is someone's wedding gift that they got from their grandma exactly. who's now dead and it's worth so much to them. To the person that steals it, it's worth nothing to the person. It's just a net loss to mankind of utility. So I, I don't think that stuff's good, but the question isn't does it make sense? What I'm trying to, we, we should never try and understand the mind of an attacker, or not at this point. We're really just trying to understand the mind of a defender. How can we work out if our house is secure or not? So, thank you for that. Let's take a break. Everyone get some fresh air. Try and move around and get some oxygen. We'll resume after the break. Okay, so, um, have more people been thinking about the sequence? I hope so, that's good. All right, don't, don't say what you think the one is, but I'm really impressed. I wanted to show you two more things about security engineering, and then I'm gonna flip on and we're gonna start talking about cyber. We've got something called security everywhere. It's a link on the side, a bit further down. Um, security everywhere is a page we've got where you guys post things you see in everyday life that demonstrate things that we've done in the course. So today, what have we done so far? Not much, but we've learned some of the principles of security. We've learned about security through obscurity and over-reliance on that. We've learned about the difference between thinking like an attacker and thinking like a defender. Yes? Just, just in our break, um, I was just trying my student card in that computer lab. Yes. And it failed, obviously. Yes. Um, and a nice guy just yes. opened the door and said, would you like to come out? Ah, so good. And you know what was awesome about you doing that? That you tried it. <laughs> That's the million dollar thing. So. What we want is people, not to break the law, I'm not saying you tried to break the law, but, but we just try things. You don't think, hmm, that'll never work. You think, maybe that'll work, or maybe that'll work, or maybe that'll work. You have this spirit of just optimism, eternal optimism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. 
Um, so that's great. So, um, so security everywhere is you notice something and you post it on that page. So we've talked about just a few concepts so far. If you saw something in the news that illustrated that, you'd post it on the security everywhere page and everyone could see you doing it. Plus, it's evidence of your analysis skills for the job application. At the end, if you could say, I made 17 security everywhere posts, um, that's really good. The Lancaster bomber, a friend of mine in Malaysia told me this story. It's quite an amazing one and true, I wouldn't lie to you, that during the Second World War, um, the British were fighting to have air supremacy with the Germans. Essentially, um, whoever had air supremacy sort of had control of supply lines and shipping and things. The air superiority was important, but the problem was the aer aeroplanes were being shot out of the sky faster than either side could build new ones. So both sides were getting fewer and fewer planes. And the Air Force was really worried that Britain was losing so many planes. And they tried to work out how they could defend their planes so that um, they wouldn't lose so many. So they got um, a mathematician, I think, from Cambridge, a really brilliant guy. Um, and they asked him, how can we stop our planes being lost? Uh, and we want to armor them, because when we armor them, the, the damage is less likely to destroy the plane. But the armor is heavy, and it reduces the range of the plane. And to armor the whole plane, would make the plane so useless that it, it couldn't fly very far at all. So we just need to armour some parts. Which parts of the plane should we armour? And this guy, who I'm embarrassed to say I've forgotten his name, but I hope someone will find his name and put it in the course notes. This guy, I think, was a security engineer because he scoped the whole thing and he saw what was important. And so what he realised, first of all, was he needed to gather data. So he gave uh, a cutout, um, like a, a, a profile, a stencil and a plan of the plane, showing elevation and also plan views of the plane. And they had lots of sheets of it and he gave it to all the different aerodromes around the country. Uh, and whenever the Lancaster bombers would return from uh, a bombing run, they would just put a red dot, or a dot, here it's red, on the part of the plane that had suffered some sort of um, uh, anti-aircraft fire damage or damage from another plane. And then each, uh, now most of the planes didn't get hit, I think only 10% got hit on one run, uh, on any given run, and the ones that were hit were only hit a small number of times, I think the average was two or less. But by aggregating all these bits of paper, essentially putting them on top of each other and holding them up to a light and seeing the dots, he built a sort of uh, accumulative map of, of a Lancaster bomber where they get hit over a long period of time. So he gathered this data. The gathering data is awesome. So that's step one about being a good security engineer. But step two that's really good is he then analyzed the data and he did the best analysis. So with this data, with only a small amount of um, uh, uh, shielding, which part of the plane would you armor? Don't call it out, just work it out. Suppose you've only got a finite amount of shielding you want to put on as little as possible. Where are you going to armour? Don't call it out. Uh, you guys have it? Yep. Um, wouldn't it depend on figuring out which parts of the plane are more critical? Yeah, 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 yeah. He only has this data, but that's right. Uh, the analysis really involves asking the right question. Which are the critical parts of a plane? The engines. The engines, because? Because the ones that didn't return with the ball holes. Yeah, so what you're going to say? I heard the story before. Yes, you knew the answer. Yeah, yeah. The important thing isn't uh, where the bullet holes are, it's where the bullet holes aren't, because these were the planes that returned. So planes are capable of returning if they're shot around here. The planes that get shot, especially around the pilot, don't come back. That's really interesting. I thought he was a very clever guy. And that is what I mean by thinking like a security engineer. That's the sort of thinking we want on this course. We want you to take a problem that you've never seen before. We give you the problem. You work out. Hmm, you just scope it with your security eyes. and You think, what is the important thing here? And you make your call. Now, in real life, in your professional life, you'll do this all the time. If you've got an interesting job, you won't always get it right, but hopefully you'll often get it right or you'll largely get it right. And that's the difference between being successful in a job and not being awesome.